thank you. Um, and um, thanks for the organizers, uh, to the organizers for inviting me to speak. This has been uh, a really interesting and fun workshop, even though we had to have these rearrangements. Um, <clears throat> so like Mike, uh, I'm a philosopher and not a mathematician. And much of what I do know about the relevant mathematics I learned in part from people at this workshop. So there's not very much I think I could tell you about mathematics. And so like Mike, I thought I would say something about why philosophers might be interested in some of the mathematical issues that have, have come up in this workshop or that have laid to this workshop. Um, and so <clears throat> I thought in my talk, I would talk about, say something about how, how the philosophical foundations of QFT bear on the issues of applicability that Mike talked about on Tuesday, um, which are sort of the issues that originally got me interested in the philosophy of QFT. So um, in Mike's talk, he described three contemporary approaches to understanding the relationship between mathematics and the natural world. Um, I agree with his description of the philosophical state of play right now, but for the first part of this talk, I wanna back up a little bit and say something about how these came to be the major approaches to this problem. Um, so this means pinning down a little bit more precisely what the question is. Um, um, but I also wanna describe some of the specific problems the philosophers had with older approaches so that we can see why the contemporary options are what they are. So Pythagoreanism and structuralism, which Mike talked about the other day, are these two contemporary views and they're different. Um, but when you compare them to what sort of came before, they start to look pretty similar in some ways, which makes sense because they're designed to avoid the problems that these older views faced. So <clears throat> after I describe the exact features that I'm interested in, I wanna talk about how these bump up against the use of mathematics in quantum mechanics and in quantum field theory. So one general problem is that quantum field theory can't be put into the right sort of form for most views of applicability. For a lot of philosophers, this is just evidence that quantum field theory is just not carefully formulated and we shouldn't take it seriously until it is. This is the issue that Mike just talked about uh, a little bit ago. Um, but there's a specific problem when it comes to quantum gauge theories that philosophers of physics have been worried about since at least the 1980s. Um, put briefly, there's a precise sense in which most accounts of applicability require a formulation of QED, for example, that never mentions U1, um, and a formulation of electroweak and QCD that never mention SU2 or 3. Since there isn't such a formulation, um, the usual stories about applicability run into problems. And then finally, I want to talk about how some recent work in the mathematics of renormalization of gauge theories bears on these issues. This is just going to be a brief indication and nothing I say is new. Um, and I learned <clears throat> most of it by reading stuff from people at this workshop. So, um, but the, the big upshot of the talk is basically the sort of negative one about philosophy, that there's problems with the sort of big picture of applicability that everybody sort of shares right now. <clears throat> and I don't have anything particularly to say what we should do instead. Though I do think that the strategy I'll describe in the first part of the talk has more going for it than most philosophers today seem to think. Sorry. <clears throat> Wrong in my throat. Um, okay, so I wanna start out with, there we go. Um, a specific version of the applicability problem that I'm interested in, it uh, comes about in the early modern period, which is what philosophers would call the period from about 1641 to 1781. Um, and so I think this is, you know, this, this is the precise version of the applicability that, that I'm interested in. Um, and and the, the issue is about how to combine two facts. So on the one hand, it seems possible in mathematics to have proofs. And, and in fact, it seems like this is what mathematicians do a lot of the time is write proofs. Um, but on the other hand, it seems like we could apply mathematics to the natural world. So Newton's law of gravitation is a one over our potential. And so we can derive Kepler's laws from this. Um, but if you combine these facts, then it looks like it's possible to prove things about the natural world. And you might think this is weird. Um, it means you know we're able to know with certainty that any planet has to move a particular way. Um, even if, you know, planets that we're never going to encounter that are in the past or might not exist yet or ever. Um, and, and similarly, we can know facts about the structure of the space in which these planets move, even though we sort of in principle can't experience space itself. Um, we can only experience things that are in space. So in 1781, there's basically two main answers to this question, where they say either one or two, we're going to give up of this things we're trying to combine. So one answer says something like, well, look, 
we design mathematics to describe things in the world. And so obviously it applies to physical things. It's just this descriptive language we have. Um, and, and this answer definitely gets the applicability feature of mathematics easily, but it totally gives up on the possibility of proofs. Because if mathematics is a language for describing the world, then statements in mathematic, like mathematical language like two plus two equals four, or a squared plus b squared equals c squared, these are statements about the world. And so they're true or false, just in case the world is the way that they say it is. And this means that the only way to do math is to go look at what the world is like. Trying to prove that there's 27 lines on a cubic surface is like trying to prove that there are seven continents on the face of the earth. Sort of, it would be obviously silly to try to do the latter thing. You have to go out and look at the number of continents and talk to people and decide how to count continents, things like this. Um, and, but, but if mathematics is this descriptive language, then it turns out it's sort of just as silly to try to prove how many lines there are on a cubic surface without going out and exploring the cubic surfaces um, and talking to people that look at cubic surfaces and deciding how to count lines like this. Um, so this, would, this is sort of a surprising result, but philosophers often will just accept surprising results. And so some philosophers did just say, okay, turns out you can't do proofs in math. Um, but, but most philosophers found this, uh, did not want to accept this and still don't. Um, they think that mathematical knowledge is basically the highest quality knowledge that there could ever be. Um, and so they don't want to go in for this. They didn't then, and most people don't now want to go in for this mathematics is just description of nature picture. Um, so instead, the other option at the time was this picture where mathematics is about things that exist outside of space and time. Um, they exist outside the realm of possible experience. Uh, so for example, space is an instance of this. And the study of geometry is the study of this object that isn't in space because it is space. Um, because these mathematical things are outside of any experience, we can only learn about them non-experientially. For the thinkers I'm thinking now, like Descartes and Newton, um, they just said, well, you know, God gives us perfect non-experiential knowledge of some features, and then the rest of the features we get through reasoning. And, and the, it, it's possible to prove things about these, these objects because they exist outside of space and time, and so the truths about them are timeless and they don't vary from place to place. Um, so that gets you the proofs, more or less. Um, but it's unclear now what these non-spatial temporal objects have to do with experience. So, you know, how can the derivation of Kepler's laws tell us anything about the way planets behave if this derivation is really about these things outside of space and time? Um, so there's no obvious answer, and I don't think there was really ever a non-obvious one either. Usually what people would do is they would mix Pythagoreanism and hand-waving. So like Kepler's law describes the orbit of a planet because the orbit of a planet is actually a mathematical thing. And the geometry of space has consequences for the shapes of physical bodies because space is, you know, sort of like a container. And so a body in space is like when you put water in a jug and, you know, a jug makes water take on a certain shape. Um, I mean, this is sort of like explaining general relativity by thinking of putting heavy things on a, a trampoline and saying, look how it deforms. But of course, it, it's gravity that's doing that. I don't know. It, that, that sort of explanation of the sort of jug shaping the water being like space shaping bodies doesn't, it's not clear exactly what's going on there. Um, but so right in, in this story in 1781, we get this new strategy for tackling the problem. Um, to, to get the basic idea, start with the applicability question. So it seems like mathematics gives us knowledge that goes beyond any possible experience. It's not just that any planet that we've ever happened to run into has an elliptical orbit, but that every planet has to have an elliptical orbit. And so in any possible experience that we have involving a planet, that planet has to have an elliptical orbit. Um, but how could you ever know something like this, right? So you could look at as many planets as you want and every one that you look at might have an elliptical orbit, but what if the next one doesn't, right? Um, it seems like any two experiences that you have of two different planets could differ in any old way. The size and the color of the planet could be different. The size and shape of the orbit could be different, things like this. But that's not actually right. Um, any two experiences that I have are gonna be the same in at least one way, which is that I'm the one having the experience. And so the stuff that I bring to the table is gonna be the same no matter how the world is by itself. And so in particular, my sensory capacities for locating myself and other objects in space-time are always gonna be the same. And so any facts about these capacities are gonna be constant across all of my experiences. Um, and since these are the capacities that I use to represent objects in space-time when I'm doing science, any facts about these capacities are gonna to have to be true of any scientific representations of space-time too. 
So on the one hand, any facts about our cognitive capacities for representing space-time determine facts about the specific spatiotemporal representations that these capacities give us. And so in particular apply to scientific representations. Uh, but because these are facts about our capacities, we can justifiably say that any representation produced by these capacities will also have to have certain features because these capacities produced it. And so I can investigate any possible triangle without leaving my office, right? I just need to think about my capacity to represent triangles. Um, and I really can't prove that one of our potential leads to elliptical orbits because this is ultimately a fact about my cognitive capacities to represent orbiting bodies. So the new big idea of this strategy is to notice that any possible empirical representation that I produce is gonna be shaped by my capacities to produce this kind of representation. And so features of these capacities are gonna determine certain things about any possible representation that I produce. And this gives us the possibility of proof without giving up applicability. Um, so this strategy has its ups and downs over the next couple hundred years. Um, it was very influential for about a hundred years, but uh, over that time, there is um, an increasing dissatisfaction with the sort of empiricism that goes behind it. Um, and instead, people are starting to be attracted to naturalism, which Mike mentioned has now become basically dominant. Um, on the empiricist picture, science is ultimately about human sensory experiences. And this is what allows the strategy that I mentioned before to work. Facts about human cognitive capacities are gonna to have to figure into any scientific facts at bottom because scientific facts are about sensory experiences. Um, but in the 19th century, um, many people, may, Hermann Helmholtz being maybe the main one, um, made large advances in physiology, which suggested that we couldn't scientifically explain human sensory experiences. So you can explain visual experiences by appealing to facts about the dynamics of light and the biology of our retinas. Um, and, and similarly, you can explain auditory uh, experiences in terms of air pressure and um, the uh, cilia in our ear and things like this. Um, but if that's true, uh, then human sensory experiences can't be what science is about at bottom because there's something under these experiences that's scientifically explaining them. Um, and so giving up on empiricism, which people started to want to do, means giving up on this new strategy for combining the methodology of mathematics with its applicability. And people sort of fell back on the two old options where either math is about the physical world and proofs are a mistake, or it's about a world of objects that have nothing to do with the physical world. And so it's hard to see how math can be used to predict or explain anything about it. Um, but around the turn of the 20th century, there's a series of attempts to sort of resurrect this strategy that I'm talking about. So uh, the first new version said, okay, fine, scientific representations aren't conditioned by human sensory capacities because human sensations are not what science is ultimately about. But science is still a human project of describing the physical world. And so human descriptions involve concepts like bigger and smaller, heavier and lighter, things like this. And so what if mathematics is really about human concepts? Then it makes sense to do proofs because you don't need to go out and explore the external world to see what's true about our concepts. You can just reflect on them um, because that's what you're bringing to the table. Um, and then of course, mathematics is going to apply to scientific descriptions of things because describing things means applying concepts to them. Uh, and sort of best of all for this picture, mathematicians had recently used the picture to make real progress. So this is the picture that Dedekind appeals to in his definition of the real numbers and his development of abstract algebra. Um, but it sort of quickly turns out, right, that this can't really work either. The idea that mathematics is about concepts works, at least at first, because every concept has a set of things that fall under it. So you can identify the concept red with the set of all red things and the concept cat with the set of all cats and, and things like this. Um, but there are some concepts that don't have an associated set, like the concept of an ordinal or the concept of a set that doesn't contain itself. Um, and so there's this mismatch between sets and concepts. And so that's a mismatch between mathematics and concepts. And so there, there must be something else that mathematics is really about. Um, but this is maybe a smaller problem. And so maybe you can change things just a little bit to get things to fit perfectly. Uh, and this is the sort of last try of the strategy in, in 1934. Um, this idea is that facts about mathematics are like facts about grammar. And so they're still sort of linguistic and they appear in any scientific representation, which gives us the applicability. Um, but also, huh, um, 
sorry, I just got a weird thing from Zoom. Um, but also you can still know that two plus two equals four by sitting in your office and thinking, just like you can know what an English sentence means, even if you've never heard it before, uh, by reflecting on the meanings of words and how they're arranged. Um, one of the best features of this new picture, at least for the philosophers that proposed it, is that it does justice to all the different ways of doing mathematics. So classical mathematicians use excluded middle and the axiom of choice and things like this, and constructive mathematicians don't. And it's hard to see how to decide like which one's right. Um, but on the picture of mathematics as grammar, asking whether the axiom of choice is true is like asking how many grammatical genders there are, right? In English, there aren't any. In French, there are two. In German, there are three. Who's right? I mean, that question doesn't really make sense, right? Like, what would it mean to discover that, in fact, out in the world, there are five grammatical genders? It's, it's, not, the, it's not tracking facts about the world. It's just tracking facts about this talk of genders, is tracking facts about our language. Um, so it's a sort of famous story uh, among philosophers that the person who proposed this last version in 1934 abandoned it in 1935. That story is not really true, but it's um, part of a myth that philosophers like to tell each other is part of the story of why the views of mathematics popular today are popular. Um, but so th the problem with the idea that mathematics is analogous to grammar is that by 1935, we have a theory of a formal theory of grammar um, coming from linguistics and Tarski and model theory. Um, and this theory of grammar only becomes more and more successful in the back half of the 20th century. And it applies to mathematical language just as well as it does to anything else. Language of, of science, language of everyday life, uh, language of morality, these sorts of things. And so if I say snow is white, what I've said is true just in case snow is white. If I say there are infinitely many prime numbers, what I've said is true if and only if there are some numbers out there, in particular prime numbers. And so mathematical statements are not about the structure of our language. They're about the things they say they're about, numbers and sets and things like this. So if we're won over by the success of formal semantics and basically every contemporary Anglophone philosopher is, then the main question in philosophy of mathematics is what are numbers and sets and things like this and which statements are true of them? Um, and these are the questions that have dominated Anglophone film math since the forties. Um, so on this new semantic picture, what becomes of our question about capability? Well, if we assume that some axioms if we, if we assume some axioms and we can do proofs, um, and we can do these because they tell us, proofs will tell us uh, that every model of these axioms will have to have certain other properties. So maximal ideals are all prime because every model of the ring axioms, every maximal ideal will be prime in that model. Um, now, maybe there aren't actually any models of these axioms because mathematical sets don't exist or something like this. Um, and so maybe every mathematical theorem is empty is one of the, the options. Um, but proofs at least make sense because they're just concerned with what follows from what. And when it comes to the truth of the axioms, we have to look elsewhere. As for the application question, well, that's solved by the fact that everything is a model in the Tarskian sense. So Lorentzian geometry can be used to model space-time because the set of space-time points has the structure of a Lorentzian manifold. More generally, mathematical objects represent physical objects by having the same structure but different underlying sets. And what some mathematic model, mathematical model says about a physical system is determined by thinking of it as a model in the Tarskian sense uh, and interpreting that linguistically. Okay, this is sort of a long preface, but the major takeaway is that in contemporary Anglophone philosophy of math, the most important idea is that any mathematical object is a model in a Tarskian sense. It's a structured set. It represents the world if there's a structure preserving map of the underlying sets of the mathematical object and the world. Um, and this is important because we really, really want mathematical language to have the same formal semantics as any other kind of language. The point of spelling all that out is so that I can be very precise about the major problem that philosophers have had with quantum field theories in general and gauge theories in particular. I mean, one thing is that, you know, as Mike was talking about, we don't have a neat, tidy axiomatic theory with known models that include four-dimensional and mills. Um, but we do have a neat and tidy axiomatic theory of classical gauge theories, classical gauge theories. Um, and, and these still cause problems. And so next I wanna say what these problems are. So in the classical Lagrangian theory, um, the dynamics for a Newtonian particle moving in an electromagnetic field is given by varying uh, this action. Um, here X is the world line of the particle and A is the potential for the 
Maxwell tensor field strength. So that is to say that the Maxwell tensor F mu nu is the exterior derivative of this one form A. Uh, for various reasons that I'm sure everybody here is familiar with, you want to think of F mu nu as encoding true physical degrees of freedom and of A as a representative of the equivalence class of the induced field strength tensors. So, you know, this is a story that every philosopher of physics learns in school that the configuration space of the electromagnetic field in classical EM is the space of two forms, and it admits a distinguished rejection from the space of one forms. And then that the classical action for a particle is really a function on the space of two forms. Um, it's only written here in terms of a representative of that class for convenience. But this sort of picture leads to problems when you try to quantize. Again, there's a sort of general problem and a specific one. The general one is what philosophers call the measurement problem which arises for any quantum theory. Um, this is the problem that in application uh, in quantum mechanics, there is context where we treat entangled states as statistical mixtures of classical states effectively. I mean, we do it and it does good predictions and things like this. Um, the problem is that there's no sort of generally acceptable story about when it's okay to treat an entangled state as a statistical mixture. Um, I don't have anything to say about the general problem, I just wanted to flag that that's something that is in the background, I suppose. The more specific problem that arises for gauge theories is that the space of two forms isn't a good model of the classical configuration space of ENM, at least in some semi-classical contexts. So um, consider the equation of motion here for the wave function psi of a quantum particle moving in a classical electromagnetic background. The wave function at xt is an integral over all paths to xt weighted by this exponential factor here. Um, this exponential involves SA, which is the same action as the classical case, but it plays a different role in the dynamics here. And because it plays a different role, we have to deal with the fact that our classical interpretation of the action doesn't really work. Um, the problem is that the action SA doesn't actually descend to a function on the space of two forms. Right? Two potentials can give the same field strength without giving the same action A. This is okay um, and doesn't cause problems in the classical case because when this happens, they only differ by a constant and constant shifts don't make a difference to the other Lagrange equations. And so philosophers tend to ignore this issue. Um, I mean, maybe it's better to say that philosophers just think that Lagrangian mechanics is, the, the Lagrangian theory of electromagnetism is false. Um, it gets the right answer sometimes, but because we have to sort of literally interpret the equations, it misdescribes the facts because it distinguishes between different field strength tensors. Oh, sorry, distinguishes between different potentials that give the same field strength sensor, which is what is ultimately about. Um, but right, so in the semi-classical case, the constant difference in the action leads to a constant phase difference between paths, and this leads to a detectable shift in the wave function's amplitude. This is the aharna bohm effect. Um, and so two physical, two different physical configurations can have the same field strength, meaning that the, say, the space of two forms can't be the space of classical configurations. And so the question is, what is the correct classical configuration space? Um, there's two ways philosophers have reacted to this. Given the philosophy of mathematics that I outlined at the start, in terms of these literal interpretations of Tarski models, um, you have to say that the configuration space of classical E and M is the space of one forms, uh, because we have to take the equations literally. Um, and this is really mysterious because it seems like gauge equivalent one forms still represent physically equivalent configurations, and so. It seems like any difference between gauge equivalent one forms has to be purely mathematical. And that means that our physics is keeping track of purely mathematical differences. And so it looks like purely mathematical facts are being directly represented in our physical theories. Um, some philosophers have used this to argue that there's an independently existing realm of mathematical objects that directly make a difference to the physical world. Um, and that mathematics is in the business of describing these objects. Um, but for most philosophers, this picture is too spooky. Uh, so the idea that you know, purely mathematical differences could have physical effects is hard to reconcile with like most of the general features that you expect of mathematical objects, even if you're not sure exactly what these objects really are. Um, and so most philosophers think we need a reformulation of electromagnetism. And, and we need this reformulation because we have to interpret the mathematics used in science literally because it's a model of a logical theory, and the world is also a model of that logical theory if the, theory, if the scientific theory is accurately representing it. And so we need some new structured set C that can serve as the configuration space. Um, 
This space has to be compatible with the classical theory. And so any configuration in it has to give a two form field strength. And we also want to continue to think of the potential in the classical theory standing in for its image in C. If you combine these, then it turns out that C can't be the space of sections of a sheaf, which is what the uh, AB effect demonstrates. This is already a surprise to most philosophers. And so a lot of the philosophical literature on gauge theories is about trying to understand how to interpret space-time dependence that isn't sheafy. Um, but most importantly for, for, for us, and I think, you know, Generally, um, the new configuration space needs to be compatible with quantum field theory, since after all, we think the electromagnetic field is ultimately quantum too. So, so far I've introduced the general theory of the applicability of mathematics that you'll find in Anglophone field math today. Um, we need to interpret mathematical language literally because of the problems with other, other ways of trying to deal with it. Um, and literal interpretation means treating everything in terms of these Tarski models. Mathematical objects represent physical systems if there's a map of their underlying sets that preserves the relevant structure as Tarski models. Um, and then I've pointed out that or introduced this problem that gauge theories pose on this picture, which people are very well aware of. Um, if we interpret the formalism literally, then there's features of the mathematics that seem not to map onto features of the physics. So one possibility is that mathematics really does map into the world and the world just has a whole lot of undetectable mathematical structure. Most philosophers want to avoid this conclusion, but for this, they need a reformulation of electromagnetism that doesn't distinguish between different one forms. So in the last part of the talk, I wanna say why I think the search for that kind of reformulation, reformulation is doomed um, and why it tells us something about today's standard picture of applicability. So consider the quantization of pure Yang Mills, um, it'll be clear if we use a non-abelian Yang Mills. Um, naively, you would compute the partition function using something like this path integral, maybe inserting some currents. Um, there's well-known problems with interpreting this kind of integral measure theoretically, <clears throat> uh, in, in all cases, not just the Yang Mills case. Um, but we can give it a formal interpretation in terms of a stationary phase approximation whereby you replace the integral over the whole classical configuration space with an integral over the classical solutions reweighted by a function of the Hessian of the action. So this worked perfectly well for scalar theories and um, low spin fermionic theories, um, massive theories. But unfortunately, uh, this sort of formal stationary phase interpretation breaks down free annuals theories. Uh, if you take the classical configuration space to be the space of Lie algebra value of one forms on R4, for example, and you take S to be the Yang Mills action given here, then the Hessian of S vanishes everywhere. And this is because S has compactly supported symmetries, the gauge transformations, and these obstruct the invertibility of the free theory. So, okay, this is, you know, you learn this in chapter seven, I think, of Peskin and Schroeder. Very familiar. What do you do? Introduce the data pop it goes, introduce new fields, new terms for them, both kinetic and interacting. Um, so this works, but on our picture of applicability, it makes everything way more confusing, right? So now we have all these new fields um, and they have these bizarre physical properties with their mass uh, energy spectrum and their relationship to spin. And how does this new theory relate to classical electromagnetism? And like, where can we find these fields at the classical level? And then, you know, things get even worse when you want to use the BV formalism and you introduce anti-fields and you have to go out and find those. And when you have higher gauge transformations, you have ghosts of ghosts of ghosts of ghosts. Um, and so on the standard approach to interpreting the applicability of mathematics, the quantization of gauge theories is just totally baffling. All these new fields get introduced. They have bizarre physical features. They're introduced to solve particular problems of quantization and renormalization. And so we can't just get rid of them. Like you can't do the theory without introducing these things. But that means we have to interpret them literally, unless you know one day the mathematicians save us by reformulating the quantum field theory into a set of axioms that pick out some structured sets that don't include ghosts or anti-fields or anything except some object representing the electromagnetic configuration. Um, so it's possible that. Uh, We'll eventually get such a formulation. And that's what I mean. I think some of the physics just hope we have to wait until that happens. Um, but I think that we have an interpretation of this machinery that already poses problems for the usual picture of applicability. 
Um, as far as I can tell, this interpretation is well known to people who know it, but uh, I should say that I learned it from the work of Urs Schreiber, Kevin Costello, Owen William, and Kazuya uh, Resner, among other people. Um, so at first pass, this interpretation has two parts. The first is to note that the yang mills potential can be interpreted as a connection on a pixel bundle, um, very common. Uh, the moduli space of connections isn't a sheaf, but it is a stack. And in particular, the space of sections of the stack of connections has the structure of a smooth groupoid. And so locally, it looks like a Lie algebraid. And in local coordinates on the Lie algebraid, we should expect to have coordinates on the space of objects and on the space of arrows. And this is exactly how you can interpret the Fideo pop of ghost fields. Um, and so really, these aren't new fields at all. They're part of the classical configuration space that we just ignored at the classical level and just treated as a kind of symmetry, even though it's not really a symmetry in the sense of a transformation relating distinct points uh, or distinct, yeah, distinct points of the configuration space. It's rather uh, an intrinsic feature of the moduli space of connections. Um, the second thing to note is that the anti-fields of the BV formalism can be interpreted as coordinates on the shifted cotangent bundle uh, of the space of connections. And so the stationary phase approximation that, um, ah, good. Um, uh, the stationary phase approximation that reduces an oscillating integral to an integral over the critical locus of the action can be used in the kinds of symmetric contexts we're looking at if we replace the critical locus with the derived critical locus in the sense of derived geometry. Um, so not only does this picture give us an interpretation of the anti-field coordinates, it also gives us a setting in which you can take effect, an effective Wilsonian perspective on the renormalization of Yang Mills theories in the way that Costello does. Um, so these stacking and derived pictures are doing different things. Um, but they can both be interpreted as technology for say, solving the same kind of problem. So we want to integrate over a space of connections. Our usual technology is adapted to the space, to spaces of sections of sheaves or, or you know, vector bundles. Um, but there's no sheaf theoretic modulized space of connections. Um, to form such a thing, we would want to take the quotient of the modulized space of one forms by gauge transformations, but a quotient like this doesn't exist. Uh, however, if you move to the setting of stacks, then the quotient does exist, or at least a homotopy quotient exists. And this gives us a space to integrate over. Um, but now when we want to form the critical locus of the action in the spatiary phase approximation, we need to do it in a way that respects the homotopical structure of the homotopy, homotopy quotient that we introduced. And this is what the derived critical locus does. It's the homotopic correction to the ordinary critical locus. Okay, so this picture gives us a relatively straightforward recipe for interpreting quantization, the quantization of gauge theories. Uh, all the relevant spaces can be interpreted as derived stacks. And so all we need to do to understand derived stacks is models of some theory. All we need to do to, to interpret this is to under, uh, interpret derived stacks as models of some Tarski in theory. Um, and then, and here's the problem, you can't do that in, in the way that is required for the applicability story. Um, why? Well, such an interpretation would give any derived stack an underlying set, and it would interpret every map of derived stacks as a structure preserving map of the underlying sets in a faithful way. Um, but the category of derived stacks isn't concrete. There's no such faithful functor. Um, this sort of happens generically whenever you want to introduce homotopy flavored things. Um, you know, it sort of picks out what it is to be homotopy theoretic in that way. Um, Okay, so I'll wrap up here, I suppose, a little bit early. Um, so I've tried to give this broad overview of how contemporary work in the renormalization of gauge theories bears pretty directly on the sort of philosophical questions that interest me, specifically on the issue of the applicability of mathematics. Um, so in the first part of the talk, I explained why it's very important for philosophers today that mathematical objects uh, are structured sets in a relatively strict sense. So it's not just that we can, in principle, unwind all mathematical statements into ZFC with some large cardinals. Um, what's important is that the, a mathematical object is a model in this Karskian sense. It has an underlying set and some distinguished subsets that are extensions of the predicates and relations in the language that it's a model of. Um, and so the result of unwinding these state mathematical statements into ZFC needs to produce a particular kind of 
situation, statements about sets of a particular kind, because these mathematical objects are applied to physics by matching up the elements of the underlying sets of the physical system and the mathematical object. Um, so the second part of the talk briefly explained why this picture of applicability has problems with gauge theories. Uh, so at the classical level, these problems can mostly be ignored. At the semi-classical and quantum level, you can't ignore them anymore, and there's no obvious solution. Um, in the third part of the talk, I said something about why I think there isn't going to be a solution, at least in general. Um, so the standard picture of applicability assumes that only a restricted kind of mathematics can, in principle, be applied. Um, and I think, you know, it's always a bad idea when philosophers say this kind of thing. Uh, mathematical physicists are infinitely creative and will do whatever they want. And so any philosophical story that tries to say ahead of time that they can or can't do that, they can or can or cannot apply this kind of mathematics to that kind of system is, is going to be proven wrong eventually. Um, so I'll leave off here then with the conclusion that philosophers at least need a new way to think about applicability. Thank you very much. And do we have a discussion here? So I'm here normally, you should hear me? Yes, wonderful. Okay, should I start immediately? Yes, please. Okay. So uh, thank you, John, for the, the nice um, Seminar, I will make a relatively short discussion of the, the talk, as I believe it will probably trigger many questions and discussions, and so I would like to, to leave room for them. So I will recap and comment some ideas in the, in the talk. Uh, I should mention I'm not an historian, a net of mathematics and even less of physics, so I may say wrong things or approximations. So. But there are people like Jose, who was really a, an expert who knows from inside all these things that may be will be able to comment on this. From what I know, uh, this is what I've heard. I, I think it's folklore. I don't know if it's true uh, technically. Homological algebra, which is essentially in the background of everything that was uh, said by John. <clears throat> so homological algebra entered uh, QFT. As far as I know, uh, with gauge symmetry, the study of gauge symmetries in the 70s. And among the people who were behind this, uh, one uh, is particularly important from what I heard. And I think it's probably technically true, but uh, I don't know if it's true uh, historically uh, uh, very precisely. Anyway, so I've heard that Raymond Stora was the person uh, that was maybe the main promoter of this uh, algebra, um, homological algebra approach to, to quantum field theories. And so he's one of the, the, those people who work to develop uh, what we will call now, uh, in the spirit of the, the conference, uh, higher structures, uh, the use of higher structures in uh, quantum field theory. The reason why I mentioned Stora will, will be clear later on, but it's also related to the, the talk this morning by uh, by Mila, and since uh, he also mentioned the name of Stora, and I think he's really an important person when trying to understand the philosophy of uh, physics and QFT in the second part of the 20th century. So these ideas by Stora and others, uh, they have developed, as was explained in the, in the talk, but in the direction of derived geometry with works like uh, Costello's or uh, Damien Calac that are used, from what I understand, uh, uh, deeply in John's analysis of uh, gauge theories. A general question that emerged from such developments is, is the one of their meaning for the foundations of physics and the philosophy of physics, and also for what concerns the connections uh, between the joint foundations of uh, mathematics and physics. And so, so when we're coming to questions like uh, stacks and this sort of things, and they're using physics, we, we cannot uh, make without an analysis of this joint problem of analyzing uh, mathematics, pure mathematics, uh, geometry, algebraic geometry, and, and physics together. So from this point of view, a big trend in the philosophy of mathematics during the 20th century has been uh, the development of a philosophical approach um, 
based on set theory. And this was also, I think, in the background of the talk, especially the sort of, well, the historical analysis of uh, the philosophy of uh, physics, which is clearly impacted by questions coming from uh, the philosophy of mathematics. So part of this story is well known to mathematicians, namely, the first development of set theory in the works of Dedekind, Frege, and Russell. A key idea that emerged then, um, maybe firstly in Russell, was that set isomorphisms were the key to what would be called later structures. This approach was developed later in the, in the 20s by the young Carnap, especially in his book, uh, Der Logische Aufbau der Welt, uh, The Logical Construction of the World, which was published in uh, 28 but was uh, started much earlier in the early 20s by Carnap. Carnap's idea was essentially that structures are isomorphic classes of sets equipped with relations. Uh, this is something Russell has, had already uh, said earlier, but what was uh, new or more emphasized and more clearly stated in Carnap was that uh, structures provide moreover access to uh, all scientific knowledge of the world in physics, for example, but not only, I mean, the Carnap's project in the, in the, so, uh, the logical construction of the world was much larger and it touches many, many fields, but clearly physics uh, were included in, uh, in the project. And this idea was developed, uh, especially in the Vienna circle later, there were many, uh, arguments on the relationships between structures in general, whatever is intended by that, uh, sci mathematical science, sciences, and uh, or understanding of the, of the world. So um, these ideas were very influential in the Vienna circle. I mentioned this also because we are in Vienna and uh, they were taken over later in various uh, forms. And they are probably the seeds for the development of set theory as a paradigm for the philosophy of mathematics uh, and partially of physics in the Anglo-Saxon world. So there are these, these historical roots which are important to understand the, the picture and the evolution because uh, I think mathematicians and uh, uh, physicists, they, they might be surprised by the importance of set theory in all these debates, but this has historical grounds but in mathematics and uh, in philosophy, with an impact on physics through this, uh, these ideas that were spread by the Vienna Circle uh, in particular. So what I would like to explain now is why, in my opinion, John's thesis on uh, QFT and gauge theory echo and provide materials to complement debates that are currently very lively in the philosophy of mathematics, which is the actually the the subject matter I know the best, that's why I, I put a focus on this. <laughs> but anyway, I think it's interesting to connect systematically uh, philosophy of physics with uh, philosophy of mathematics, especially uh, in this uh, area of quantum field theory where mathematics uh, have such an important and foundational role. When one looks back at the 20th century, uh, structuralism has followed two uh, big lines of, of development. Only stated, one is the one promoted so by Carnap and others. And in this uh, line of thought, uh, set theory is, the, is at the core of the foundations of mathematics, but also to their philosophy and also to their applications. And uh, here there's a, there is something important to notice. Uh, these three directions, foundations, philosophy, applications, uh, strongly correlated for people um, addressing philosophy from the point of view of set theory. But if you think about it, it's not obvious at all. There are many reasons why uh, the, the three questions can be disentangled. Anyway, the important point for us today is that uh, there has been a very different approach to structuralism in the history of uh, mathematics and physics in the 20th century. And it started essentially with the German school of algebra in the 20s, and in mathematics it was developed by, uh, mainly by Bourbaki, or Bourbaki was the main advocate of this uh, point of view. In this approach, set theory is just a convenient framework for the technical foundations of mathematics, but what is really at stake is elsewhere. The true content of mathematics is provided by abstract concepts, abstract structures such as uh, classically the, the structures 
of groups, algebras, and topologies. One reason why I mention all this is that for technical and historical reasons, I could enter details, but probably it's not the, the place to do it. Um, when you, you look at Grotendieck's ideas, such as the introduction of derived or tri triangulated categories, the introduction of derived geometry, the introduction of stacks, uh, all these notions, they fit perfectly in this approach to mathematics and their philosophy. So this structural approach. And actually, if you read carefully Grotendieck, you will see that in all his extra mathematical work, he very often advocates the idea that he was strongly influenced by this uh, structural approach to mathematics and that structures were, were in the end what he was looking for in, in mathematics. From what I know, uh, this is also true to lesser extent, but uh, it is also true um, of Raymond Stora that was very much influenced by this uh, structural approach to mathematics. It's not isolated. I mean, the idea of uh, introducing structuralism in physics was uh, poignant in uh, not everywhere, but in many parts of physics, at least in France, I think, uh, maybe because of this influence of the epistemological, philosophical, and technical influence of uh, structuralism in, Bobek, in, in mathematics as promoted by Bobek. Anyway, so uh, Stora was clearly influenced by the, this, these ideas that came from mathematics and he promoted uh, structuralism. So uh, the claim I wanted to make is that uh, there, there is first a strong connection between the philosophy of physics and mathematics when it comes to quantum field theory and uh, the mathematics involved inside. History uh, is, is important. History, so also the history of the philosophy of mathematics and of uh, the epistemology of mathematics is important to understand these things. And um, lastly, we, we should probably connect more systematically uh, what is done in uh, philosophy of mathematics because many people are interested in, in structuralism today and uh, some more people are rediscovering structuralism as it was uh, at the heart of the Bobaki pro project and uh, in general uh, in mathematics during the, the yeah a big part of the 20th century so people are rediscovering the, this way to think about structuralisms against ways that are more influenced by um, the anglo-saxon tradition with a feature of uh, well, with the accent put more on ontological problems, uh, sy syntactic problems, and so on. So th there is a, a trend in, in the philosophy of mathematics that I think is going really in the same direction that, than the one uh, promoted by John. And I think this is a very exciting and probably a, a nice area where people can join uh, forces to, to make new projects, new projects in, in philosophy in general. So that's what I wanted to say essentially, and I will leave John maybe comment on this and answer questions. Thank you very much. We have further comments, discussions. Maybe, maybe if I could just say one thing about the, the issue of, of structuralism. I mean, I, I think that that's uh, extremely right and it's exactly on point and just to say, in addition to the trends that you were pointing out um, in philosophy of mathematics and in mathematics proper, in philosophy of science, um, and this came up a little bit in my talk on Tuesday, but in philosophy of science, structuralism uh, has also been very attractive in, in part because of issues of theory change and the idea that, well, it seems like at least to some extent, science is progressive and accumulative. And there are some things that we think aren't true anymore, but that we used to think were true. Um, but there's definitely things that like have been building, and so our knowledge is increasing in science. And it's hard to to uh, it's hard to it's, it's not as hard to hold on to this in the face of the pessimistic meta induction that Mike was talking about. But one way that you can do it is to try to appeal to these sort of structural things. And one particularly prominent brand of structuralism in philosophy of science, uh, the so-called Munich structuralists, were explicitly uh, uh, influenced by Bobaki, um, and they thought we should just do for science what Bobaki did for mathematics um, and formulate it all structurally. I mean, I, I, one other point, um, which I, you know, just I guess as something that I think is, is subtle here is that, so Bobaki is famously 
got a structuralist picture and that propagates out into these other areas in an influential way. Um, but what's funny about Bourbaki, the particular brand of structuralism Bourbaki has is that they give a very involved formal articulation of a structural theory in volume one of Elements of Mathematics, which they never use again. Um, and in fact, doesn't really work. In, in the second edition, they try to expand it to, to cover things as like topological spaces, but they leave most of it as an exercise to the reader. And then in the future, whenever they're talking, they just talk about structuralism in the way that I think, in my experience, mathematicians these days talk about it too, where asking these questions, I mean, these sort of ontological questions are maybe not to the point and these structural issues, especially um, the kinds of structural issues that you're pointing out Grondig is concerned with, um, are much more interesting from a mathematical, mathematical point of view. But because there's this, so even if we all agree that structuralism is sort of where it's at, there's a further question about what that actually involves. And I think it, sometimes uh, one can find Bourbaki sliding back and forth between thinking of their particular version of structuralism and sort of structuralism as an organizing principle. And as time goes on, they're more concerned with it as an organizing principle and there's still this sort of free floating um, idea of what structure is actually supposed to be. Now, as you point out, an early analysis of structure is uh, isomorphism class. Isomorphism class in the sense of um, structure preserving bijection or invertible structure preserving homomorphism. Um, and I think that that is often the kind of notion of structure that philosophers will have in mind. Um, and so another way I think to, maybe another way to phrase the sort of thing I was at was just after it was just, um, there's more general things that you might call structure. And there's some things that you might think of as structuralist that can't be captured in the particular formal framework that they're assuming for applicability here. So I have more things to say, but maybe uh, I will stop there and I can address this, these other questions. <laughs>